Verifon Books for a reading with the author of Call Me American by Abdi Noor Ifton. Abdi will be introduced tonight by Lori Stavrand, Community Partnership Coordinator for the Vermont Refugee Resettlement Program, and Masiti Mohammed, a leader in the Somali community in Vermont. We are grateful that Abdi, who survived so much horror and literally won the lottery to come to America, could join us tonight to share his story. He came from Maine. Uh, just uh, quick housekeeping items. Um, the front door is locked. It'll reopen after the talk. Uh, if you need to exit before we are through, the back door will be open. Um, and the bathroom is located at the back door to the right. Please mute or turn off your cell phones. Um, I'm going to pass around the sign up for our new email newsletter if you haven't signed up for it already. Um, I'd like to thank Orca Media for filming tonight's event and the Vermont Arts Council for featuring the event as a Vermont Arts 2018 program. I'd like to thank you in advance for buying Abdi's book. Uh, the registers will be open all night and he will sign after he speaks. Without further ado, please help me welcome our guests, Lori and Masiti, first. It's so exciting to see everybody here tonight uh, supporting uh, the America we know and love. Um, we uh, are Vermont Refugee Resettlement Program. Uh, the state of Vermont, not Burlington area, is resettling refugees. And we are so grateful for the support that we have from our community. Um, we have a, a wonderful Somali community in the Burlington area. And um, Masidi will be speaking in a couple of minutes. If anybody's interested in finding out more about what's happening in refugee resettlement in Vermont or getting involved in any way, whether it's volunteering, donating, or participating in events, then um, please feel free to speak with me tonight or reach out after um, you know, in the office. Uh, we have December 1st, we have an event coming up. It will be a showcase at the Flynn Space in Burlington. Different talents will be sharing their culture and their traditions, and it will be a lot of fun. Uh, right now we have an art show at the Amy uh, Tarrant Gallery at the Flynn. It's open on Saturdays, every Saturday until December 1st, so please check out the art also. Right now I'd like to introduce Masiti Mohammed. Um, she... Um, also has a refugee background, uh, is and has been a leader in the Burlington community since she arrived. Good evening, good evening everybody. I am Masiti Mohammed, uh, same as the author. I also uh, don't know much about uh, my country. Uh, he knows some, so he's lucky. But I. <laughs> when I was six years old and had ended in um, Kenya where I mostly grew and became you know at least basic English speaker because we kind of benefited from the Kenyan uh, education system and then I grew up there married there and I mostly call myself as a like a Kenyan something, but I'm not. <laughs> I'm put in the middle, and then I was lucky enough to get a, a, a resettlement program a, a process uh, to come to the United States. Although it took a long uh, process, we are happy and lucky that we ended up uh, being in a safe place. And as soon as we came, the refugee resettlement was more than welcoming. We didn't know more that there will be people who will be helping us. So the refugee resettlement welcomed us uh, in a night that was full of snow, as you guys <laughs> say, <laughs> in the middle of February, the 27th. <laughs> no one was going to work, if you can remember that. <laughs> people are not going to work for three days, I think. They were sleeping and around the area. Have you ever area. seen snow? <laughs> No, back home, no. We were surprised as the, you know, the plane was landing. We thought that we were kind of put down into a, a garden of um, uh, cotton. <laughs> so, 
so it was funny, but uh, we loved it. I am in Vermont, in the Burlington area for 14 years now, so I'm loving it and kind of um, benefited from the education system as well. Uh, I wasn't good enough in my uh, education years back home because we could not finish our high school. So I was lucky enough to finish my high school and also go to college, finish my master's degree. So, I was moved by as soon as she posted that there was somebody who experienced a life like ours is here. I said, I can't wait to meet him. <laughs> I've read about him. So th thank you for joining us and coming here today. And we are from Burlington, and we are all happy to welcome you here in Vermont. Welcome. Mm -hmm. welcome. Is it time for this thing? Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. That was so sweet. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Burlington, right? Uh, we're a Montpelier. We're a Montpelier. Oh. This is Montpelier. Oh, okay. Montpelier. <laughs> I, um, I apologize. I apologize. <laughs> Montpelier. <laughs> okay. Okay, we're in Montpelier. That's right. How did I not know that? I'm staying in your house. <laughs> well, I got a lot going on, so <laughs> my mind is so busy. Um, and so many places. <laughs> right, right. Arizona last week, and then um, actually Arizona two weeks ago, and then last week Minnesota, uh, Wisconsin, and yeah, book tours doing great. Yeah, I, I liked Arizona specifically because it was hot and dry <laughs> and flat. And uh, the guy who was driving me uh, three hours from Phoenix to Bisbee, I was like, I haven't seen one river, I haven't seen one lake, what's going on in this area. Uh, because I already, you know, in Maine, if you drive 10, 15 minutes, you see something, right? Yeah. There's so much water that we have up there, probably here too. So, but thank you for, um, for having me here. It's beautiful, um, rainy, gray. <laughs> so, like, like, yeah, like yourself. Well, I came. I didn't come when, when, when snow was falling from the sky. I came when snow was like around, you know, uh, just kind of coming. So I came late August, but <laughs> <laughs> that's when the when the leaves were turning colors. Yeah. I was super excited, and then the leaves fell from the tree. I was so mad. <laughs> And then snow came and covered everything else. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I was I was so excited. I said, you know, it's interesting. And I had uh, guess what my first job was. Some of you may probably have already heard. Yeah, you know. Right. <laughs> my first job was insulation. Uh, we put a sign in the front yard and said, you know, here's a nice guy, but I can't find a job. You know, because a couple months left, and I couldn't find a job. Uh, but the first people who contacted me were an insulation company, and they said. Uh, it's all physical. Do you want to do that? I said, yes, $11 an hour. Are you okay with that? I'm like, more than fine. <laughs> I took the job, and it started snowing, and the boss warned me. He said, you need to bundle up. You know, go to L.L. Bean, get some layers, some socks, you know, stuff. So please don't come here with, uh, you know, like, light shirt or something like that. And I'm like, I think I can beat the cold. <laughs> but I called him. I called the office one morning, and I said, I can't come because I can't even get out of the house. <laughs> Um, and then that's when I actually, someone had to give me a ride, go to LLB and get gloves and things like that. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's all documented in the book. Yeah. Was, what an interesting job. I talked to my mom. I said, money doesn't grow on trees, mom. You know, I'm really working hard to get, you know, whatever I'm sending. Um, so, well, you know, call me American. It's a, it's a title that's so funny, right? You, um, like, am I American? Mm -hmm. I am. Mm -hmm. You don't really, you, you don't have to be born in the United States to be American. Mm -hmm. You know, you can, you can think of it as, as a, like when I was, um, you know, around, around 10, 9, 10, 11, 12, um, in Mogadishu, um, we just got out of the uh, 1992 drought, the civil war erupted in 1991, Somalia's war, you know, took us, and 
to the next level where like seeing bodies and dead people were just normal. It was not something to be scary about. Mm -hmm. However, I survived to the age of 10 and that was, wow, you know, once you, you, are, you survive to that age, you know that you have done something. You know, you, oh my God. You know, yeah, my brother and I were, um, when we returned from the displacement within the country to the southern side of the country, came to Mogadishu, um, the capital city of Somalia. The country at the time was called, uh, actually the city was called the city of women and children. Mm -hmm. So we couldn't find our dad. Mm -hmm. He separated from us and said goodbye and kissed us in the forehead. So we thought, we assumed that he was dead because every other child that was either my friend or in the neighborhood was an orphan. So we were orphans. And my dad is still alive. We found him a few years later. Um, yes, so uh, at the age of 10, I, uh, the, the only thing that could be an entertainment, you know, that could distract me from, from the wars, from being recruited uh, uh, or being, being forced to carry a gun was, um, was to go to the movie theater. So this woman, had opened up a, 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 a movie theater which is made of uh, tin roof, you know, it's like a shack. And there was a little television screen sitting on, the, on top of a, of a small table. And uh, she had a pile of cassettes. And these were all action movies. <laughs> the Commandos, the Terminators, <laughs> Jack Norris, and all of those, you know, sort of things. Um, so it was kind of, it was really exciting because the visual that we saw, I saw at the movie, somehow related to what was happening in the environment. You know, the, the wars, the, you know, things blown up, uh, people been killed and all those sort of stuff, but in a different way, right? Because where these guys in the movies are fighting, it's, it's not Mogadishu. It has nothing to do with Mogadishu. It's just clean streets. There's still a police. There's still restaurants. People are dining. And when they, you know, when the movie, for those of you who have seen Commando, you know, he hangs out with his daughter, right? And they have ice cream. And they're running all over the place in the mall. So you can see there's life out there. But there's also the destruction part of it, the chaos part of it. And that had really somehow got me connected. Like, I wish Mogadishu was like shiny like that. And then I wish things were blown up. I loved it. But it was not. It was dry, uh, spooky in Mogadishu at the time. Houses were there, but doors were gone, hooves were gone, and windows were gone. So somehow, that was a hiding spot for us. Yeah. You know, when my mom kicked me out of the house for bringing a a portrait of Madonna in a bikini, <laughs> and I hang it in the room, she didn't like it. So she kicked me out of the house. So I stayed, you know, any any one of, of those uh, buildings that no one could buy. It. So it was fun. <laughs> so by that time. My Americanization process was was at work. And you were ten. I was ten. Yes, and um, I was a little funny kid because it, you know, what what I was trying to do was somehow a crime in the city. Mm -hmm. um, we just, you know, the war erupted in ninety one, and my mom was saying that we had the civil war because we neglected our culture. Um, in the 80s and 70s, Somalia had movie theaters as well as uh, nightclubs. Mm -hmm. Italians and actually Europeans and Americans visited, you know, to hang out at the beach, you know, because we have really nice warm, you know, beaches up there. Um, and then my dad remembers, you know, seeing this naked woman on the beach and she feels like, I think that's what made God angry. So at this point, we're being punished for that. Oh, and then. No. Yeah, and then she said, because that's how it works. We don't have to attach to anything on Earth. This is all temporary. So we're going to be, we, you know, everyone is going to die. So for us to die, we have to die the proper way. So that's one of the reasons that she t sent me to the madrasa. And madrasa is, uh, is sort of a school where you sit on the dirt and have to memorize 114 chapters of the Quran, 6,666 verses. Um, it was not easy. And it was hard teaching, and I documented it all here in the book. But I eventually graduated from that, um, 
And then that's when, you know, when my mother says, well, that's the step number one. Step number two, you got to be his assistant. I said, nope, that was a step number one. Step number two is that I got to go a different direction. And she said, no. You know, I've been sending you to this school for many years now, and I want you to be an assistant so that you can grow up to eventually be able to, you know, become an Islamic cleric or chef or something like that. I know that's a Somalia, you know, we're all homogenous society, have one religion, one faith, and everything else. Um, however, everyone was going that direction, but I went a different direction. Why was I doing that? I really don't know. Because every kid has something to be inspired, you know, inspired of. Um, so, movies were evil things, to, according to my mother. Um, movies were things that um, turn your mind into evil, or like you think about horrible things, like hanging out with women, um, singing on the streets, dancing, and wearing horrible clothes, and that exactly happened. I started hanging out with a woman. <laughs> <laughs> I dressed funny clothes, and I started swagging and doing some dancing you know, movements on the streets, yeah. Yeah. and soon I became the idiot in the city. The idiot, yes, <laughs> everyone called me. The idiot, like the, the bad guy. In the city, it's like I was spreading a Western culture, sort of. Um, however, so many young men was were excited about that, and then I became the translator at the movies because I started picking up English from the movies and I started translating it. He says, "Oh, he says he's gonna jump off the wall," and everyone's watching, and the guy jumps. I'm like, I told you, right? And I say, "Oh, he says he's gonna, you know, he's gonna go, you know, catch that guy," and, and that happened. And so I, I became a translator. I became a storyteller. And that's where it kind of, you know, exploded for me. And then I become a little uh, um, celebrity in the area. It was like cele celebrity according to the people of my age. But the elderly people were trying to get rid of me in one way or another. Uh, including my mother, you know, she kicked me out of the house. However, um, this whole happiness ended by 2006 when Somalia became an Islamic state. Uh, there's a group called Al-Shabaab that came run over the entire country. Um, and the second thing I can remember is that I get a phone call from an unknown number and they tell me, wait, are you the one they are calling American nowadays? I said, that's my nickname, yeah. You gotta stop that sort of a thing. Drop that nickname, I warn you. And he hangs up. And it's not easy because they have killed so many people that way. You know, they, they called and warned and then the next thing you know is like your body is somewhere else. So I was freaked out. I wasn't really quite sure what to do. I knew this was a real warning. And I didn't take it lightly. So I accepted the way they want. I shaved my hair. Um, stopped listening to music. Um, uh, movie, they bombed the movie, so the movie was gone. So it, it all became nightmare. And now I was scared for my own life because the recruitment uh, of the Islamists were, were, were just happening so fast and, and they couldn't even deal, like so many young people were so interested in joining them. So they were dealing with that long line of young men of my age. How young? Um, well, it, it doesn't matter. You know, if you're eight year old, as long as you can carry again, they would recruit you. So that's, that's what was happening at the time. But someone of my age, you know, getting into my 20s at the time, um, that's what they were looking for. That's the perfect, you know, age they were looking for. So what was happening at this time? It, it, the United States uh, was not happy with what was happening in Somalia, so they were sponsoring Ethiopian troops to invade Somalia, and the Ethiopians have already infiltrated into, into Somali territory, so they were like 100 miles from the city. So we knew the war was going to happen. And the Islamists had huge speakers, you know, on top of their, their pickup trucks. And they were moving around saying, like, if you have not signed up before we come to your house, you still have time. And the recruitment centers were just like every corner of the city. So what did I do? Technically went into hiding. But you can't hide forever. Um, somehow while I was hiding, the war begins. But then, because Ethiopians actually have so much more power compared to you know, Islamists who just have automatic machine guns. 
So these guys came with their tanks, airplanes, you know, fighter jets and everything else. Half of the Islamis were killed. And these guys pushed to the city. So the Ethiopians came to the city. And then the war now shifts into, um, into insurgency, where they start you know, burying roadside bombs and then bringing sympathizers into the area. So that was when I actually came out of my hiding. And I was perfect. My mom and I separated, so she went out into the outskirts of the city, and uh, you know that's where she lived. Um, but I was walking around the city, figuring out what I need to do with my life, because I I thought that I'm not gonna make it to the next day, one way or another. You know, it, death was really so close. However, I meet this American journalist who takes so much risk to fly into Mogadishu and starts taking pictures and writing stories, and his name was Paul Solvik. Paul, you know, had bodyguards, like a bunch of militias surrounding him while he was doing this sort of stuff, you know, taking pictures and wondering who he wants to talk to. I happen to be right there walking by when I see him and yell in English, you know, that's my first time to actually try to practice English. I learned from movies. I said, hello, what's up? <laughs> um, uh, and then, you know, the, the militias were pointing their guns at me, trying to, you know, get me away from him. Uh, but he said, let him come in. So I went in, and he, he handed me a Pepsi Cola. Just one, one Pepsi Cola. I drank it so fast, and I said, do you have another one? Uh, he brings out two more, and he says, tell me your story. So I kept talking to him, and he couldn't believe my frustration and anger, and, you know, it's... Everything I said was like, life here sucks. You know, I'm not supposed to be here. It's horrible, you know. People are dying, and I don't want to, to join either militias. So there's there's no third option. It's so hard, you know, it's, it's not easy to get away from here. So he flies back and publishes my story and tells me, stay in touch. Um, actually, he handed me $50 to say, buy a cell phone and try to communicate with me. So... Um, and uh, I think like four or five days later, um, I received a phone call because I already have a phone. Paul knows my number. Someone calls me from North Carolina. I pick up. It's a voice of a woman. Um, and she says, is this Abdi? Yes. Hi, Abdi. How's it going? I just want to make sure if you, if you have time, we would like to talk, you know, discuss with you on a project. I'm like, I, I'm now outside, but I can't, I can't talk. So let me get somewhere. So I get to the house, you know, away from other people because I could be a sympathizer. You know, I could be killed for being a spy, speaking English on the streets of Somalia. Um, and she calls me back in 15 minutes and she says, um, you know, the stories of Somalia are unheard. You know, nobody ever hears about that. So would you be interested in doing a diary of your daily life, recording yourself on a phone, and can you send us the audio? I said, uh, okay, I was not quite sure if I really wanted to do that because that was a death sentence at some point because um, I was called and told not to speak English and to drop the American nickname and all those sort of stuff. Uh, so at least now I was in the area and nobody was targeting me. But speaking English, especially speaking about the stories that were happening in the city, was some sort of like it could be ex like certain death. Like, they find me and they can kill me. I said, I will think about that. I, um, I walked for miles to go to my mother. I met her and I said, Mom, don't tell anybody. And I was whispering. I said, I have a big opportunity to tell my story to the rest of the world. And these radio people in North Carolina, well, of course, she doesn't know North Carolina, so I said, America, <laughs> um, want me to tell this my story. She said, don't do it. Not even try to do it. Stay. Yes, she said, "Stay here. If it's you know, if you're supposed to die here, you're gonna die. But I don't, I don't want you to take risk and kill yourself. So that's like, no, don't do it." Um, I emailed my brother, who's in Kenya as a refugee at the time, and I said, "Hassan, this is what I have. You know, this is an opportunity, and these people want me to tell my story." He said, "Go ahead and do it. This can open a window." and it could be good for you. 
I went ahead and I said, okay, so I started recording myself every single day. Something was happening. Um, and then the audio, uh, the diaries, the things I recorded, the stories were aired on the radio as a podcast. And it became an extremely interesting, very, uh, you know, touching story. It, uh, they, they called it Message from Mogadishu. Uh, one woman, however, who actually was uh, fixing some breakfast in Yarmouth, uh, actually she lived in Vermont at the time, Pitcham, Vermont. Pitcham, Vermont. Someone in Pitcham, Vermont called Sharon McDonald actually heard my story while she was in the kitchen. She emailed quickly the radio and she said, this young man deserves a life. You know, he's telling his story in the middle of this danger. She's been to Afghanistan and she knows this type of thing. Many people can't do it. You know, it takes so much courage to actually be able to tell your own story. You know, specifically if you're in Kabul or Mogadishu or, you know, Baghdad at the time or somewhere else. You know, it's not easy. You get killed for those other things. Journalists were killed. Uh, reporters were killed. People who told their stories were killed. People who, people who spoke up were targeted and killed. So to me, it was extreme courage that I did that. Um, and then the, the radio, you know, got back, I mean, the radio, uh, Sharon, who was living in Pijam at the time, said, uh, is there a way that I can contact this young man? They gave her my email address, um, and they asked me if she could be, a, you know, if she could reach out to me. And she sent me an email, and the, the title of that email, I still remember it, was uh, Excruciating, Gorgeous, and Painful. Excruciating, Courageous, and Painful? Excruciating, Gorgeous, gorgeous. and Painful. She talked about snow, she talked about the dogs that they have, she talked about the cats, she talked about her family, she talked about the tractor that they use, you know, to shovel the snow, she talked about the barn, she talked about the horse, she talked about the chickens. I couldn't digest all of these things, and I'm like, oh. you know, I was laughing. I was, you know, it's like it's not easy reading your, you know, the email because sure. someone can see it. But I was just so happy, this type of world that she, you know, she described. And then we emailed back and forth, and then the second thing she would send is a clip of a snow where her husband, Git, was using a tractor, and she was using a shovel to get snow out of their uh, driveway. I said, this is heaven. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then that's that, uh, from there, Team Abdi, a team of, of uh, American professors, doctors, and, and, and you know, um, our friends actually got together to um, to save my life, to, to, to get me out of Somalia and bring me to Kenya as a refugee. Um, I come to Kenya as a ref and, you know, I, well, it wasn't easy to get to Kenya. It was, it took us so much time to, like, figure out how to get to Kenya because the Kenyans consider anybody coming from Somalia as a danger, as a terrorist. So they closed the border and they said no flights from Somalia can land in our country. So I went to Uganda and I smuggled myself across the border, eight hours drive, and I ended up in Nairobi, where my brother was, and he said, welcome to Refugee Live. Um, we had some cash from Team Abdi, and the first thing we did, we ate at the uh, uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> this is Nairobi? This is Nairobi. It's a big deal eating there. Yeah, it's like rich people eat there. Um, it was great. The chicken was testy. I never had any food like that. The Coca-Cola was amazing. You know, um, we loved it. We enjoyed it. And then once we walked out of that, um, uh, it was uh, March 20s, I think, 2011. And my brother said, watch out. You know, next thing you know is someone is going to handcuff you for no reason. I said, why? Why did we were just, you know, while I was like figuring out, why would they do that? Someone put a handcuff on my hand, and I saw, you know, someone was dragging me. It's normal. Somali refugees are being targeted by the police every single day. In and Kenya? All in Kenya. And all they want is money. You know what they call us? They call us the ATM machine. So they come to withdraw money from our pockets, and then they walk away laughing, you know, and they're like, nobody talks about that. Um, it happened to me many times. Um, I had to bribe myself up. So every time you're a refugee in Nairobi, uh, well, technically, refugees are not supposed to be in Nairobi. Because you're a refugee. What are you doing in the city? You know, refugees have refugee camps. 
and they're in northeastern Kenya. There's one called the Dab, and there's another one called Kakuma that people are supposed to go. But my brother had seen that, and it's horrible. You can't live in it. It's dry, it's hot, and then you only live on rations brought by the United Nations once in two weeks, and that's not even enough. So as a young man, life there is so, so hard. How old were you then? Um, I was 25. Yeah. Um, so I come, you know, my brother and I, we realize that, and we start selling socks, hats, you know, uh, uh, whatever we could sell. Um, and that was sort of illegal business, but we needed some sort of income, you know. So we woke up early in the morning and went to this store, and the guy hands us so much stuff like clothes and hats, and he's like, go, you have two hours, you have to sell everything. So we would come dashing on the streets and, you know, sticking whatever we were selling into the windows of cars so that people have to, you know, have to buy or, or maybe say like, no, get away from me. So it was sort of danger, you know, we could have been shot. Um, but somehow I was really okay. You know, it's like, it's not Mogadishu. I don't feel like nobody's gonna, you know, recruit me or do anything to me. So life has felt good and I really bought a nice shirt and jeans and shoes and, you know, um, was going to restaurants when I had money and we had team, team Avi and we were discussing what are the best ways that we could come to America. Um, and then I met Neen, who's now sitting behind you. She, Neen actually tutored me English, beginning from 2012, I believe. And she became a tutor, and my English, you know, from the movies now turned into sort of like learning the grammar, and reading a lot of good uh, articles written, and books, and all those sort of things. And so that was so interesting. And I felt like, even though I was a refugee, but I had a future. I was looking forward to something. You know, learning English and getting connected to these people, and we landed. My brother and I landed uh, two different colleges in uh, in in Nairobi. Well, I want to I want to clarify this. As a refugee, we, you are not supposed to go to college, so it, that's not how it works. But as long as you can pay money in Kenya, you can do anything. You can get citizenship. You can get passport. It all depends on money. So uh, with Sharon and everybody else writing letters, we ended up. Uh, I ended up going to a college called African Nazarene University, and my brother went to uh, another um, college. So the two of us were now busy, you know, going to school and working, just, you know, figuring a way out. Uh, but however, we, I tried student visa to the United States. Uh, I applied for a community college in Maine. The college accepted me, surprisingly, when I did the test, some test. And they said, you're great, we're gonna send you the forms, take these forms to the U.S. Embassy, and you're all set, you know. It depends on the U.S. government. If they, if they give you the visa, come over here. You know, you can stay in the school, and then once your education finishes, you can move back to your country. I was so excited because this was the closest I could get to come to the United States. So we put everything together. We have uh, letters from uh, Bernie Sanders and other people that wrote letters that are like, you know, this young man deserves to come to this country and study. But the U.S. Embassy did not give me a visa. They denied me. Um, they denied me based on bureaucracy. I remember what he said. He said, uh, listen, you know, a student visa is a non-immigrant visa. That means you're not immigrant. So if you go to the United States, go to college, and study, how can you prove that you're going to come back? And tell me where do you want to come back? He said, do you want to come back to Somalia? I said, mm -mm. Do you want to come back to Kenya? I said, mm. So where do you want to come back? So in this case, I really have a reason to not give you the visa. Goodbye. Of course, I was devastated. But I realized that how hard the American immigration system is. Um, I want to take you back to before I left Somalia um, and before I met Sharon and before I met anybody else when Somalia was run over by the Islamists, I was figuring out one way I could get out of Somalia. And there were two ways that Somalis actually left Somalia at the time. One was crossing the ocean into Yemen. Mm -hmm. There's the Gulf of Aden, which sits between Somalia and Yemen. Another one was going through Ethiopia and across crossing the desert, through Ethiopia and Sudan, and then crossing the desert, and going all the way up to Libya, and then catch a boat to like Malta or, or Sicily, Sicily yes. yeah, those two islands in, in, in Europe. Um, the one crossing the desert was extremely expensive. 
three thousand dollars or something like that i could never get that money never whatever i do the other one in uh and you know crossing the uh crossing the gulf of aden just costed eighty dollars eight zero mm -hmm. so i worked so hard as an as a conductor someone who you know assistant to the driver bringing people up to you know in, in mogadishu at the time so I worked for months and I only earned fifty dollars. So I want to read a small, like, an, a, an, an excerpt from that and talk a little bit about the book. There was a lot of jostling, and the malicious fired shots into the air to control the crowd. Finally, the boat was ready to leave. The passengers hidden under a heavy tarp. They were off to Yemen. I wanted to be on that boat with my friends. I didn't care how dangerous it was. I did not want to go back to Mogadishu. I watched into the line for the next boat. When it was my turn to pay, I handed the smuggler my 40 American dollars. Where is the other 40? He shouted. The boat is $80. I started telling him I didn't have the rest, but he didn't want to hear my story. He threw the cash back in my face and said, fuck you, and moved on to the next person. In a few minutes, that boat was off, me still on the pier, miserable beyond belief. Evening was settling in Bosaso, and the crowd waiting to get on the boat grew larger. I needed 40 more dollars. I did not know what to do. So I walked back into town to see if there were any jobs available. I found nothing. There was no big market like Bakara where you could find odd jobs as a, tour, as, as a toot or porter. And I knew that the more time I spent in Bosaso, the less money I would have. Because sooner or later, I would need to eat. I skipped dinner, but I had to get breakfast. Locals figured that the migrants came with a lot of money, so they were gouging prices on everything. Bread and tea that would have cost 20 cents in Mogadishu were a dollar. That night, I lay on the beach next to a crowd of migrants waiting for the sun to rise, a few hundred feet from the pier. In the morning, I went back to the pier and saw a familiar face. It was Abdullahi Madobe, a man from my neighborhood in Mogadishu. His wife and two kids were with him, all trying to get to Yemen. When he saw me, he ran over. We chatted a bit. I told him I had financial issues, but I, Tool was hoping to get to Yemen. He wished me good luck. I watched as he and his family boarded a boat and slowly disappeared over the horizon. By afternoon, we heard that Abbas and Ahmed's boat had made it to Yemen safely. I was happy for them, but all I could think about was my own sad situation. I paced up and down the beach for hours. Mostly, I didn't want to admit to myself the obvious I would be going back to Mogadishu. Then came terrible news. Abdullah Himaro's boat had capsized a few hours off the Somali coast. Mm -hmm. More than 70 people drowned. Mm -hmm. Abdullah and his family mm -hmm. did not return. Mm -hmm. Had I been on that boat, I probably would have died with them. Mm -hmm. Had I been on Abbas and Ahmadi's boat, I would have lived. As I trudged back to the basketball, I felt my whole life was like that. Every day that I could remember was a matter of life and death. So that was basically what life in Somalia looked like at the time. It's just a, you know, a matter of life that. that was so Risking beautiful. your life. Beautiful. Right. Um, I mean, you know, they, they, uh, there's two movies that they made out of Somalia. One was called uh, Black Hawk Down. Mm -hmm. Another one was called uh, Captain Phillips. It's about the Somali pirates. Mm -hmm. So these movies, about Somalia, it's all about what? Just malicious, you know, how horrible life is and all those sort of stuff. Mm. Of course, there's all that documented in this book, but one message that you find in this book is the, um, is the human desire for survival. It's just a basic right for all of us. You know, we need to survive and we need to live. We need to eat, we need to go to school. I taught myself English. I avoided recruitment. I went to Kenya. I met friends. I landed on college. I, you know, went to college, not even being able to eat sometimes a day. 
you know, but that was what I really needed to do. But then it just shows you how the American immigration system isn't as easy as we all think it is. Right. As a young man from Somalia, and around that age, when America, you know, puts Somalia uh, under probably the axis of evil, I think. It's like one of the countries that they, the United States government considered as a, as, a, um, as a safe haven for tourists. So how could, like, let's assume you're an American interviewing immigrants. How would you trust a young man from Somalia shows up to your window for an interview, and I speak English? And then the first thing they would ask, like, when was the last time you were in Somalia? And I would say 2011. That was pretty close. Mm -hmm. So it's so hard for the U.S., you know, people who interview the uh, officers to really trust us. But then there's no way that they can read my mind. There's no way that I can have my story to them so that I say, you know, I would say, like, I'm not really what you think. I'm not a danger. I'm not a, I'm not a tourist. And being a Somali does not make me a tourist. Being a Muslim does not make me a tourist. Being, you know, uh, a refugee. A terrorist? A terrorist? Yeah, terrorist. Like someone who makes problems, like someone who blows up things. You know, that's that's the main theme at the time about Somali. When you, I mean, in, still in Kenya, Somali is synonym to to uh, terrorism. Um, it was it was not really easy. Uh, I got denied a uh, student visa. Um, and then what's the next thing I could do? I didn't give up. You know, that's when you know what you're, you're up to something. Um, my friends and the supporters and people who were so close in my, in, you know, in my life, they, they were just also thinking about ideas. But one thing that many people didn't know about is something called the diversity visa lottery, right? And I happened to be in the right coffee shop one evening when I looked across the street and I see a note on the wall and I walk up to the note and he says, apply for the US diversity lottery. And I walk into inside that building and the guy you know, who's running all over the place says, it's real, you apply, you win, and you go to America. <laughs> and I said, are you kidding me? <laughs> He's like, yes, it costs a few cents. But if you're lucky and if you win and you go to the United States. And I said, do you know people who really, really did this? And he's like, two guys. And I said, why don't you go yourself? I said, I've been trying this since 1999. I'm not lucky to win. So, so many people have tried it. And I'm, I was like, ah, oh, this guy's been trying since 99. I don't know how, how much luck do I need to win this thing? Anyways, it cost me a few cents. And I applied, you know, with 10 of my friends. And we said, let's wish ourselves luck. Six months later, everyone had to find out, you know, um, who, did anyone listen to This American Life podcast called Abdi and the Golden Ticket? That's me. <laughs> that's, that's where the story be begins. <laughs> so, yeah, and uh, we had to apply, you know, and, and six months later, we had to, you know, everyone has to make sure who, who won. Uh, my friends went first, and everyone was like, not selected, not selected, not selected, not selected, continued. No one had won except me. Oh, I put on my information, and I couldn't believe what the screen was saying. You had been randomly selected for file processing on this visa. Oh my God, yeah. yeah. They, uh, they threw me around. My friends were so, so, so excited. And then I was like wondering, so what's next? Am I going to America tomorrow? You know, I wasn't quite sure. And I realized that that was just step number one. There were so many difficult steps ahead. And one of them included, uh, I had to put together all the documents from Somalia. I had no documents at all, no passport, no birth certificate. That's why first chapter number one in my book is called Born Under the Tree, you know, and Under the Neem Tree. Uh, I say I was born in 1985. Uh, my mom doesn't know when. Uh, I need to find out the month. She doesn't know the month. I need to find out the day. She doesn't know the day. And I call her, Mom, when was I born? She's like, uh, she, she usually says it was hot and humid. <laughs> <laughs> but guess what? It's always hot and humid. It's it's hot. <laughs> we don't have snow. We don't have fall. It's, it's always the same time, right? Um, so, yeah, and I picked that, you know, June 20th, uh, actually when I came to America, because in Kenya, my birthday was January 1. And almost every refugee was born on January 1. I can't believe, on my Facebook, January 1, 
I have 700, 800 uh, <laughs> birthdays, and I'm like, happy birthday to all refugees. <laughs> Wish you all luck, so many cakes. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I try to be a little bit more sophisticated and professional, so I picked uh, June 20th. Why? Because it's World Refugee Day. So I stick with June 20th. So June 20th is my birthday. And the book actually came out June 20th. So it, it was all timely. Um, and uh, so it kind of tells the stories that are not in those two movies that I mentioned. You know, these the stories that people need to hear. Um, and it's in just my memoir, you know, how much I love this country and how much I avoided everything else to come here and most importantly, find life. I'm not looking for anything else. I'm not, I'm not looking for to take or steal anything from this country. I came here to contribute as much as I can, but most importantly, to just belong and be part of it. And there's a lot of, you know, talk over there about integration and assimilation. Um, I totally understand. Some people are freaked out of assimilation. Assimilation might mean you need to throw that scarf and you know uncover your hair and be part of these people. Uh, integration might mean no, you don't have to do that. You know, you just integrate, but you know, attach to your culture and religion or what you know, whatnot. Um, and then there's the melting pot that you know many people say like. This is a melting pot country. It's like who's mel who wants to melt <laughs> into something else, um, right? And then there, and, and then it's like, what about if we become a salad? Like the salad has so many different ingredients, <laughs> and it all tastes good. It's delicious, but no one like the the tomato is not melting into the cucumber, so they are all over there. But you eat them together, but it's so delicious. So we can be like that. So that's basically, you know, so my feeling of America changed a little bit when I came to this country. was like when I was in Somalia, I avoided speaking Somali. I spoke English all the time. Why? Because I thought it was wonderful. I was so obsessed with it. I didn't even speak good English, and I remember swearing a lot. So the swear, the swear words were kind of like backing me up every time I can't find, I can't find a word. And my friends loved it, you know, they just wanted to hear me say like, oh, say this. And I said, and they're like, you sound like Arnold Schwarzenegger. And I'm like, great. <laughs> and now I realize, now I realize that I have a better accent than him. <laughs> Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't he have an accent? Very yeah. yeah. Right, right. He, he can't say, uh, he can't say little. No. He says little. So who's, who sounds more like American? Here? <laughs> and he's the one I, I learn English from. So I mean, it just, you know, it, it, yeah, isn't that interesting? Um, I know. So when I came to Boston uh, and, and this, the family actually moved from Beecham, Vermont to Yarmouth, Maine, uh, I, I landed in, in the United States August, August 11. And that was the day after Michael Brown was killed in, uh, in, in, in Missouri. The, the young black man was shot and killed by, by the cops. And then the Black Lives Matter was, was just, you know, kind of emerging. Um, did I care all about that? I did not. I landed and yelled, I'm in America, you know, and, and the, the lady who was so bored next to me in a flight um, just had, you know, had smiled. And she said, wow, really? You're excited? You know, with 20 hours of flight, that you know, <laughs> you're excited to be here. I said, yeah. Um, and uh, so we drove all the way from, from Logan Airport to Maine on 295. And, and it was like 9 o'clock at, you know, at night, so dark. Somehow I thought that I was kidnapped. Mm -hmm. Who was so, driving you? Uh, this the people, uh, uh, the white American family in Yarmouth, Maine. We never met, but they had been supporting me forever. But the reality kicked in when I was sitting in the back seat the car and we were headed home um, and then what was going on in my mind is that I'm completely different than all other Somali immigrants because I didn't come to the US being considered a refugee so I had no assistance from the US government I wasn't given any um, 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 uh, counseling on trauma or PTSD or anything like that so I ended up in this family's hands right and my family were 9,000 miles away from me and now while we were driving for three hours to get home, the thing that was ringing in my mind was, uh, <coughs> is this gonna be okay? 
am I gonna like this? How do you really will? How will you interact with these people? What's gonna what's what is it gonna be like? What's America like? You know, this whole confusion and 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 things that created my mind just actually surprised me because before the plane landed, I was the heaviest man on earth. I just yelled everything, but then reality kicked in like within a few minutes. And um, we got home. Um, they have a beautiful house, you know, like sits very close to the Royal River. And uh, they have horses and chickens and all this stuff. So you can imagine how big the property looks like. And looking through the window of my room in the morning, seeing deer and turkeys and everything, you know, this wildlife grazing. So you can't see the next neighbors. Like they're, you have to walk up a while to get to their house. Um, so I realized this does not look like the American that I see in the movies. <laughs> uh, it was like the Walking Dead kind of area, <laughs> you know. Uh, no pedestrian, like you can't see people. People are driving around. It's very quiet, and I was, you know, I was freaked out. And we walk up, and uh, and uh, there was still all this breaking news on the television, and people have been talking about it. So um, I call her my sister. Natalia is the daughter of the family, and she and I actually started walking next day to get introduced to the neighbors and you know they were so curious and asking me what well, Yarmouth is like a town of 7,000 people extremely less diverse you can't see a person of color in the area and I was the new guy in the area so um, every neighbor had to know me before they dialed 911 or something like that what? right so we got to meet every neighbor and, and said mm, my name's Abby and I'm here I, I don't know how long but you know I'm here now uh, and I'm excited, you know? Um, and I was wearing a coat, even though it was still uh, August, uh, but, I thought, <laughs> but I thought it was really, really cold. Yeah. Um, so my introduction was interesting, and first thing I asked it was like, where's McDonald's, where's Dunkin' Donuts, and where's all this stuff? I thought everyone loves it, and then they said, oh, if you wanna go down that way, three miles, go. You know, I went to Dunkin' Donuts, and no one wanted to come with me because you know, no one wants to drink there, maybe, I don't know. Um, and I realized, I realized it's two things. I realized two things that were really, really difficult. Well, first, first thing was, um, how do you order something? There's a menu. I have no idea what the menu, you know, what, like hot chocolate sauce, <coughs> for example. Um, and second thing was, when they take you order, they need to write down your name. So when she asked me to spell my name, I wasn't quite sure what to say. I said, Abdi A B D I. Uh, she was just a young woman, just hired, you know. And she was like, A, -A for what? <laughs> we Africans actually never spell out our names. So it was one lesson to learn, right? And then, you know, we went back and forth, and then I realized when I came back home, I was like, do you guys spell out your name? Yes. So A for what? Like A as an apple, B as in maybe Bangor, you know, city in Maine. <laughs> D as in maybe Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> and the I as an iPhone. So I memorized it. Now wherever I go, wherever I go, when they ask me for my name, that's what I go for. That's, that's, that's what I say. Apple, Bangor, Dunkin' Donuts, an iPhone. It's funny, isn't it? But I, that's what I say. I'm like, you know, everybody else is like J as in John. I'm like, I'll be as in, I don't know. So that's what I go by now. Um, Yes, sadly. Um, so, the, the, you know, the, the book came out like a little after Trump was elected. Um, so I was kind of finishing it up, finishing it up. Um, and it's my first book. It's a memoir. I hope everyone will like it. I hope everyone will buy it. Uh, um, you'll find so many interesting stories in there. Um, I still have, you know, PTSD. I and mean, there's no question about that. It takes quite a while get cover to recover from it um, but to me I don't know how long will it, it will take because um, I didn't come with my family uh, my mother lives on the same street on you know when I describe chapter one two three and four she is still out there and it's horror it's extremely difficult to read um, and when I'm writing she was helping me um, with with all these events and things that happen in you know in the area but she's still there so you can imagine what it feels like to, to be here and trying to get away from the past, but I can't because the past lives in me. Where it's like my entire family is still out there. So uh, when I receive a phone call, um, my whole 
world goes back and like I'm right there. I know where she is. I know what's going on. Um, and she wants to come here, not because she loves America, but she's tired of the war. She's tired of the conflicts that are happening in there. Um, she wants to come here and stay here temporarily until you know she can go back at some point. Uh, can I do that? I can't. It, you know, I'm still a green card holder. Even if I become a citizen, it, it, it's a long process. So I look forward to voting 2020. Yeah. I cannot vote this midterms. I can't because I have a green card and they don't let us vote, sadly. That's Even though I'm more American than Trump himself. Everyone's more American than Trump. Well, actually, I'm more American than many people because I, you know, I still have so much of an appreciation for the things, the privilege that we still have in this country. Uh, but I can't vote. I'm not really part of uh, the process of this country yet. So I'm still considered as a refugee, as an immigrant. And I'm like, when will I ever see myself get away from these names? You know, when will I be called American? When will I be called my name? Avi, you know? It's like I received emails and text messages from people. It's like, do you want to talk at this event? It's for refugees and immigrants. And we thought you're the right person. I'm like, of course. <laughs> Everyone still thinks I'm still a refugee, you know. It's yeah. like it's there's no, it's not easy to get away from it. Um, I crossed into Canada before Trump was elected. I went to Quebec. You know why I did that? Because I have never ever legally crossed into another border. Mm. Oh, wow. <laughs> right. I crossed my borders, but never with the document. So it was so interesting to hand out my green card to the officers in the Canadian looked at it and said, you know, welcome to Canada. And then on the way back to the US, just showing them, they looked at it and they said, welcome to the United States. So it was a huge moment, turning point in my life. Um, now for the past year and a half and maybe in the future until the White House is the White House it is now, yeah. I'm not really considering to go anywhere at all. My brother has got a, he was denied to come to the US um, two weeks when Trump came. Um, and then they, they, you know, they sent him an, a letter which says all routes, or I can't remember what it was, maybe all you know, avenues, yeah, that's the right word, all avenues were exhausted. Mm -hmm. So don't even try to apply or come for an interview again. Mm -hmm. It was devastating, but Team Avi now turned to Team Hassan. We got him a Canadian process through a Canadian judge, and he's coming to Toronto sometime oh, very soon. Yay. Yes, oh. but can I go see him? I don't think so. So for those of you from Vermont, I have a question for you. Who, who lives in Derby? <laughs> I, I, heard that there's, I heard that there's a restaurant in Derby. Oh, is it library? Where you can come from the Canadian side and then to the US side? That's what we were thinking. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and then hang shake and say like, you're in Canada, I'm in the US. What's up? Is that, is that possible? Okay, great. So that's, that's really good to know. So there's like a, a black line that crosses. Down the middle of the no. building. Down the middle of the building. No. Once you're in the library, you can go anywhere in the library you want. But you have you, to go, like the door you go in, uh -huh. is the door you have to leave from. You can't go into the library from America okay. and leave the library to Canada. Oh, okay. No, you can't do that. But your brother can come in from Canada, mm -hmm. and you can come from America. Okay. You can walk around all the library, everywhere, oh. and shake hands all you want, and then you must leave by the way you came. But what happens if I try to leave the Canadian? No, Is there like... There's a video camera and... Oh, there's... Ooh, ooh, ooh. Okay, that's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> huh? They will tow my car and no, they come after. Oh, they'll come after me. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's good to know. That's that's a, that's really good. To know. That's what we're trying to do. Yeah, and we will document that. Having your brother in the middle of the library in Derby. Right. Derby. Right. It's amazing. Because we can't meet. He can't come here, and I can't go. You know, and that will show how complicated this administration is. You know, how they're trying to separate us, but we're trying to find each other. So that's what we're trying to do, and I will keep you posted. <laughs> <laughs> All right, questions now. Uh, yes, sir. How did you meet your tutor? <laughs> do you want to answer that? Uh, so I heard um, the story of Abdi and Mogadishu 
from Sharon, our friend who we we lived in the Keystone at the time, and and they lived in Keystone, and so I started hearing stories about all these things from them, from Jim and Sharon, and it was Sharon who said, you know, Hassan and Abdi are just hanging out in um, Nairobi. They're trying to get a student visa, and I was teaching college writing at the time. Would you be willing to, you know? So we just set up kind of a correspondence course by email. And um, I put them in touch with some of my students. And it's just an opportunity for them to practice writing English. Did you with the Skype idea in mind that, hmm? Did you Skype? Did, did you do? We didn't Skype. No, we did it all by email. We, yes. Yeah. Oh, but you Skyped with Sharon. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And I never did that. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're a good teacher. <laughs> Um, I, I define American as, as a human being who has, um, <coughs> dreams and has a heart for all the good things. It, it bothers me to see a division in this country and, and some of the things that people argue about and some of the misconceptions and misunderstandings that kind of rotate around, you know immigration or refugees or things like that but I have my own way of seeing America I have my own story and uh, you know I I escaped recruitment uh, I escaped war I escaped everything else that you, you know you could suck you in um, to just come here in this country and <coughs> to leave the freedom that this country has so I really appreciate the freedom that this country has um, and in the eyes of the world, even before I came to the U.S., I mean, you know, the way many people see America is as an exceptional nation because of the founders of this country and the things that has that have been written and the laws um, and the opportunities, plenty of opportunities that people have. So as long as you appreciate those things, I mean, I, you know, think you're a good American. I'm not specifically targeting a party because uh, I don't even know what party I, I associate myself with. Sometimes Democrats get into my nerves. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but as long as you love, you know, as I love everything that this country is doing good, um, appreciate it. And that's why I say I'm really more American because so many people don't understand what they have. But I appreciate what, you know, what we have in this country. Oh, and when I was in Somalia? Yeah. I did, but like I said, it was expensive. Oh, I totally yeah, the only way to go there was through okay. Ethiopia, Sudan, and then desert, and then okay. cross right. yeah. some sort of ocean. But that was, if I had that money, I wouldn't be here now. Yeah. Yes, yes, I would have done it. I tried Yemen. I mean, my life is, is full of lack, determination, risk, so many things. Um, but who knows? I mean, I have friends that survived the boats, you know, the... the the, 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 the travels that they did across the Gulf of Aden, but today they're still out there in Saudi Arabia. They haven't done anything for their lives. They just live from hand to mouth. Whereas I left 10 years after them, came to Kenya, and came to the United States in the last four years, and I have done so much, including writing a book and going to college and all of these things. So, yeah. It strikes me that, um, first of all, I you are a fantastic storyteller, um, and this has been it's such a pleasure. But um, what really strikes me is that you had this incredible one stroke of luck with the lottery, but the rest of it has been your own perseverance, your, your dedication to your dream, your courage, um, and, and your your decision to make your life a life of purpose and gratitude. And um, it, it moves my heart to, to see, see you standing here alive 
and beautiful and not dead on the streets of Sumatra. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, uh, well, yeah. Um, my, my mom says that uh, I was not supposed to die. So, it, you know, it's like, it's like that. Sometimes, you know, when, I mean, in Islam, in our culture in Islam, we believe that there's every, everyone has a, 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 a leaf in a tree, and that tree is somewhere out there in heaven or somewhere else. Yeah. And then once that leaf fails, that's the end of your life, you die. So she says, your leaf's still green. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, yeah, but don't, te don't tell me about it, because when I hear it turns yellow, that means I'm gonna die, so I don't wanna hear. Uh, so yeah, I, uh, I, I survived to this day, um, but my family are surviving the worst. Yeah. You know, they, they go to bed every night thinking about, I'm not sure what's gonna happen tomorrow. Mm -hmm. My sister has five kids, and I, kept, I keep telling her, stop, you can't have no more babies because I'm financially responsible for taking care of you. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they, they're just living the regular life of uncertainty. Um, it's so good that my brother is eventually be able to come to North America, and uh, maybe five years from now, he and I will do something when maybe this administration is gone, maybe he will be yes. able to come here, or maybe be able, I'll be able to go. I can't wait to introduce him to Christmas. <laughs> Those are one of the things that I, I'm really so proud of because being with this white American family in Maine, so I have learned so many things. You know, they taught me how the dishwasher runs. They taught, they taught me how the uh, oven and the toaster, you know, how to do all of these like tiny things that you guys take for granted. Yeah. Um, and the first time they put me behind the wheels, like I crashed into their garage. <laughs> but they, but they said it's fine. You know, if that has move on. So they have been. So so kind, extremely kind oh, to me. And I think great. every day, like, what can you give back to these people? I mean, they have done so much that I can't even do for the next 10 years. Because as a refugee, where would I get $1,500 to buy a ticket to come to America? I can't. As a refugee, I can never get my money, that sort of money. They raised it, and they took care of it. So, yeah, so much efforts and kindness, yes. Two hands. Mm -hmm. Let's go for you first. Okay. Um, thank you for your talk. Mm -hmm. And do you still like to watch movies? I do. <laughs> Last one I saw is Meg. Oh, yeah. Well, of course, there are so many other movies that just came out, but I can't because I'm touring around. They send me to Arizona, all these places. Like, I'm stuck in a hotel. I don't know where the movie theater is. So, once I things slow down, I can't wait to go back to the movie theater again. <laughs> but, yeah, now it's not out. I mean, some comedy and, and other movies, like, you know, I'm not catching up with, but I love Star Wars as well. <laughs> yes. Um, so I, I'm teaching your book currently uh, to my college students at St. Michael's, and cool. I wanted to say, first of all, I have been so incredibly moved, not just by the story, but by the quality of your writing, which I see as in incredibly artful um, and loving and what I wanted to be able to say to you was how impressed and inspiring your non-judgmental view of people is. Mm -hmm. And in particular, the scene in Baidoa, I hope I'm saying that. Mm -hmm. That's correct, right, yes. Um, where you were a six-year-old boy and you picked up the bullet mm -hmm. and you handed it to the, the young man who was, mm -hmm. was searching the home where you were and, mm -hmm. and you saw him as a person mm -hmm. and that that thread goes through the book in so many different ways. I called him uncle. And that you see people as people, mm -hmm. and I'm so inspired by that mm -hmm. um, and grateful. Mm -hmm. And I, my question now, 20 minutes later, is um, <laughs> what are you doing now for work besides stuff for the book? I mean, what job have you found in Maine? What are you doing in your community there? Um, I'm an interpreter, uh, community organizer, fixer, you know, and uh, so, um, the community, most of the community have been through the same experience. I mean, there's two different of them. Somali's biggest displacement happened in 91, so some people were so lucky to already get out of Somalia, and they haven't seen what we have seen. Um, when I picked that bullet at the age of six, and to call the guy uncle, it saved my life. You know, he found me as, as, a, as an innocent kid who hasn't done anything, 
But around that time, people have already been crossing the, the Somali border and went into, into Kenya. And I'm sure that by 1992, Kenya had 300,000 Somali refugees, and the influx have even grew larger uh, uh, from there. Um, but now in Maine, um, there, there actually is not, I mean, there, there's probably a larger Somali community compared to Vermont, but there isn't a lot of them. Uh, Portland area where I live, there's just a handful. Um, and I talk uh, in my chapter, Respect. Um, I talk a little bit about the community and, and my honesty, just my own interpretation, because I worked with this community for over two years now. And the things I see is that people feel like they're here temporarily. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they might be sent back when they can't get here. Yeah. Well, yeah. one thing to know is when you come to the U.S. as a refugee, you need to know that you're here permanently because you get a green card and you get a citizenship and you move on. Um, but people aren't going to the adult aid to learn English. People aren't feeling like I can really adjust to America, it's really hard. People don't feel like, you know, I, I want to eat apple pie and steaks and burgers, American food. <laughs> People feel like I need my life, I need my, my cultural tradition, I need a predominant, like Somalis are so proud, just in case you didn't know this. We're tribal, we appreciate um, our values and norms or whatever we have in the country, and that's how we live. So if my mother has neighbors of our own tribe, she would be the happiest on earth. But for her to come to Portland and live in an apartment with other people that she might not understand and could not be able to communicate, she won't like this place. She calls it temporary. And she's expecting Somali to have peace at some point. So I, you know, walking through the community, so one of the things that I was trying to just bridge the gap was, uh, well, first of all, let's accept that we're here. Right? Let's not fool ourselves, like, this is home. And this is home because the people who came 97, who said we're here temporarily, had kids. And their kids today are going to college. Mm -hmm. And the kids don't speak Somali anymore. They're Americans. They're Americans. They completely assimilated. And then that even drives you know, people crazier. It's like, I don't want Americans to steal my kids and my culture, my heritage, and all that sort of stuff. But instead of thinking we're here temporarily, why don't we actually accept but then find a way, uh, well I understand some complicated issues. America teaches one English language in the schools and most kids get their things from the schools. Um, and that's a bigger problem. You know, there's no way that I can solve that. I mean, if you hire me to teach Somali at the high school, I would be more than happy to actually teach Somali. Uh, but is that necessary in America? It's like, Many kids, no, we don't have to look at Somalis only. They're Vietnamese, they're Chinese. Like, what do you want to do with those, you know, sort of kids? Now there's Spanish, of course, um, which is still. So I think that's one one of the problems is that you know just scares uh, some people that I worked with. But also the kids that were born here that are Somalis, Somali parents, some of them are so successful, <coughs> extremely successful. They went to college, they found their values, they appreciate their culture. They might not be able to speak Somali, but they're out there advocating for Somali culture, mm -hmm. advocating for Somali music, mm -hmm. advocating for, for integration, and they're doing those sort of jobs. And where can you find them? Go to Minnesota. There's a lot of them. Minnesota? Yes. <coughs> There's a lot of them that are really, really doing that sort of a job. I have a good friend that last time I was there for my book tour, I met this gentleman who's my age, but speaks zero Somali, but speaks about Somali speaks, you know, to the community in English about Somalia and teaches about Somalia because he has read it. He's well versed. He he's understands. He's very knowledgeable. It. He's very knowledgeable. Uh -huh. So he's teaching the other younger generation, you know, about our culture, about our music, and he somehow even can put it in a better way than I can mm -hmm. because he's really that's what he talks to them, you know, mm -hmm. some stuff. So every no everyone's not failing, but every community has ups and downs. So. Yeah. There is, yeah. yeah. So if the community is divided there, then it's here between Somali Somali and Somali Bantu? Somali Bantu is, uh, is a separate. Um, <coughs> they're Somalis, but they have their own community. Yeah. Um, and the reason is, um, I hate to say this, but there's some sort of discrimination within Somali community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Bantus are really discriminated. 
because they are farmers and they were kicked out, kicked out, kicked off their lands, and other tribes took them. And the, I remember in the in the night before 9/11, one of the recent one of the interview questions that they, uh, the U.S. embassy would ask people is if you're Bantu, you're discriminated, so that you, it would be easier for for the Bantus to come to come to, to the United States. So in Maine, there's a large, actually growing, uh, number of, of Somali Bantus. And they speak the Mai dialect, which I happen to speak because my parents, you know, come from that area. And uh, and they, they're doing really, you know, great. I mean, they have their ups and downs, but uh, they're, I would say, separate from, from the other Somalis. The Somalis here discriminate against the Bantu as much as they did in Somalia? The answer is yes. Um, two days ago, uh, a Bantu man was, was uh, and this is all of the news, but not, not on CNN, but on Somali news. You probably know about it. So someone was burned to life, and he was from Bantu because he married a woman who was from the other tribes. So he was burned alive, and uh, there's all this hashtag now on, on Facebook, on Somali social world, saying like, you know, I'm, I'm bad too as well, this sort of stuff. So we still have that discrimination. Wherever we go, we bring our tribal affiliations. Um, I'm being attacked for for my tribe as well, many times. And I, I document it in my book, because I belong to the Rahan Wing, which are considered lower class. Why do they consider lower class? They're so large. But unfortunately, they're farmers. They're, you know, they, they, they love their nomadic culture and stuff like that. But in, in the Somali uh, city people, they, they somehow don't associate with the nomadic people. You know, they're considered as bad things, you know, like they're bringing, like, for example, I talk about when my mother, you know, they said my mother smells like a goat pee, the, the goat pee. And my mom's like, I love my goats. I love the way the goats smell. But when someone calls her, you smell like goat? I mean, is that an insult? She, was, she didn't find it as an insult, but many people found it as an insult. Um, so that exists, and uh, I, I hope there should be some movement. To, I don't, I'm not sure if I'm the right guy, but there must be. And this is part of the movement of like discovering the truth. You know, it's like I talk about it. I talk about what the tribes did. I talk about how, who killed who. You know, why are we really fighting? Who are the Rahan Wayne? Um, I don't mention a Bantu at all because, you know, that's, I just, I'm writing one book. Uh, but I, I kind of talk about basic introduction of how the tribal things work in, in Somalia and, and why we still can't find these. I mean, who's, who's fighting in Somalia? It's, who's fighting? It's us. It's yeah. tribes. Yeah, so we're killing each other based on, like, you belong to this tribe, so I don't want you. That sort of a thing. So that's, we displace ourselves. You know, the war, civil war was started by, by, by us and, uh, and uh, I don't know where we got this tribal thing from. I don't even believe it's true. Because we all look alike. <laughs> you and I look alike. As I start, I was like, where does it belong? <laughs> so you were thinking which tribe I belong to. <laughs> <laughs> See that? Welcome to the Somali world. <laughs> She tell. can't, she I can't. I could tell. I could tell that he was from the Halloween. Because uh, you read my book? No. How, how, would you, how would you tell that? By a sticky What? <laughs> <laughs> That's so interesting. <laughs> I look like every other Somali. <laughs> so it's so funny that you, huh? I don't know. Which, yeah, I don't know. Which no, we don't like I really seriously don't know. Because you look like everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> but I can tell you one thing. You grew up in Kenya. Of the accent. I don't know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, welcome to the Somali world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was like an American, it's like, I'm from North Carolina, I'm yeah, from yeah. somewhere else, yeah. but we identify ourselves as our tribe. But not in a good way. Sometimes we kill each other, so it's not good. Yeah. <laughs> All this care of the other, it's, you know, America is full of it too. Right. But, you know, it's, it's this terrible fear that someone who doesn't look like you or people mm -hmm. in the old culture is mm -hmm. going to I don't know what. Yeah, I don't know yeah. that. Okay. Yeah. But That's right. Thanks guys.